Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to Voices from the Bench. We are at episode 122. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. How's everybody doing? What's happening, Barbara? How's life down there in Florida? All right, so we're going to go over this again. It's 95. It's super <laughs> hot. It's actually been raining. We have a couple storms out in the, uh, I think, Atlantic and one in the Gulf, so it's getting a little busy. Yeah. But even busier is at night dental. It's been really, really busy. So the doctors yeah. are prepping, the patients are coming back, and so good news for all. Yeah, we're seeing pre-COVID numbers, yep. minus a couple accounts, but yeah, it's some good stuff happening right now. Good, good, good. So with last week's news of Lab Day East being canceled, LMT announced this week that they will be having a big Lab Day Online 2020. We don't have a lot of details at this time, but it's scheduled for two different Thursdays to Saturday weekends in November. So mark your calendars, November 5th to the 7th and November 12th to the 14th. There'll be some sort of online Lab Day experience. Wonderful. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. So once we hear from the good people at LMT, we'll be sure to let you know and maybe even have someone on the podcast from LMT to talk more about this exciting alternative to the cancellations of, as we know, West and East. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Let's have them on the podcast to give us an update on what it's about. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to virtually seeing everybody from the safety of my own house. Yep. <laughs> so Barb and I love us some denturist. We have had many on the podcast over the years, and we love to hear their stories and to hear about their passion. We also like to learn about how their state got recognized and how they're doing during these interesting times. This week, we got to talk to two denturists rich in family and state history out of Washington State. Val and Sharon from Northwest Dental Services and Denture Implant Center, and Melissa Lee Berlot from Northwest Dental, they come on the podcast to talk about taking over after their fathers and grandfathers who made denturism recognized in their state. They talk about the early days of acceptance, going through the schooling, opening their practices, dealing with the COVID, and then they get into how we can help other states get recognized too. So join us as we talk to denturist Valen Sharon and Melissa Burlot. Barb, I got a call from a doctor who's looking for a new lab. What? That's awesome. Did they start to send you work yet? Yeah, but unfortunately her impressions are terrible. Miss margins, distortions all over. I don't know what to do. Well, she's probably looking for a new lab because the last lab stopped taking her impressions. You know, bad dentists, they go from lab to lab to lab. Yeah, that's probably what she's doing. But you know, I just got this account. I don't want to lose it. When I talked to her, I asked what impression material she was using, and it was some brand I've never heard of. Yeah, there's a lot of crappy impressions out there. I don't understand why offices use cheaper materials to save money up front, but in the end, it ends up costing them twice as much, and with all the remakes for us and for them that they end up doing. And, you know, we gotta eat the remake costs. Yeah, that's so true. I really wish I could find an impression company I could rely on for help, and the doctors can get the help they need for us to get the records we need. So there you have it. Check out Kettenbach. This German manufactured impression materials taking the U.S. by storm. Not only do they use top-notch patented technology, but they have a dedicated customer service team that will work with your accounts, which is amazing. Interesting. So do I just call the doctor and tell her to switch? You know, what if she doesn't want to? Well, you know how doctors are. Most of them are pretty open and say, hey, if I can do better, please let me know. So if I was you, I would tell her to call Kettenbach Direct Give her the number of 877-532-2123. They've actually got a $99 starter kit. They will put her in touch with a local rep. And they also have a lot of materials that labs use every day, like the Panacell Lab Putty Hard and Lab Putty Soft. They've got Soft Reline. They've got Bite Registration Material. And when a lab orders, guys, listen up. 
25% off your first order. All you have to do is mention the code Dental Lab Podcast 25. Plus, they sell direct, so there are even more savings. Whoa, wait a minute. I've heard about that lab, honey. We use it here in our lab. I didn't even realize it was made by Kettenbach. That is amazing lab putty that our technicians love. I'm going to check out kettenbach-dental.us right now and then call my new doctor. So just hearing Elvis say it's an amazing lab putty, there you go. There's a super awesome recommendation. So call him. Thanks for your support of the podcast, Kettenbach. Thank you. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. So Barb and I are super excited to welcome to the podcast two denturists from Washington State. Now, we love the denturism here on the podcast, and we always enjoy talking to you guys. And our good friend Patrick made this kind of connection, because I know both of you guys are very predominant in the Washington State area for denturism. So let's welcome everybody. We have Val Sharon, and you're at Northwest Dental Services. Yeah, in Tacoma, Washington, about 30 miles south of Seattle. 30 miles south of Seattle. Excellent. And then we are joined also with Melissa Burlot from, not to be confused with the other one, Northwest Dental. Correct. And where are you located at? We have several offices. Our main one is in, we have one in Bellingham, Washington, Burlington, Arlington, and Everett, Washington. Wow. Oh, wow. We have a few. Nice. We're north of Seattle. Almost where I live is pretty close to the Canadian border. Cool. Again, thank you guys both for joining us. And I thought we'd just kind of start off with talking about how you got into the industry and how you got into denturism. Melissa, I have a pretty good idea on how you got into it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Val, why don't we start off with you? How did you get into this? I'd be happy to. The uh, nepotism actually runs deep in our profession. I started also from my father. Oh, okay. Excellent. My dad was one of the first uh, denturists in the state of Washington, took classes to be able to put together his own degree as actually Melissa's grandfather did. So they worked together to put together this initiative uh, starting in the 70s. And finally, we got a chance to when I was just out of college, I was hired by my dad's company after finishing up doing a little financial work. And, and he said, he said, you know what, why don't we run this initiative here in the state of Washington? And and gosh darn it, why don't you just come on board and try to help it along with it? So we, we got together, Melissa's father, her grandfather, my dad, all kind of got together and put together about 12 significant people and passed an initiative in 1994 here in the state of Washington. Wow. So it wasn't even legal until 1994. So we don't like to say legal. Okay. <laughs> we like to say recognized because truly... Denturism is legal in every state. It's the simple fact it's just not recognized. We have uh, educational opportunities all throughout Canada. In the state of Washington, uh, we have an online course out of Oregon. And anybody can get licensed or can get recognized as a licensed uh, professional. It's just the states themselves just aren't turning around the opportunity. Only six of us so far, only six states in the United States. So we want more opportunities for each state to recognize us. So your dad was a denturism or was he doing something else? No, my dad was uh, started off in the Navy in the 1950s and learned a little bit about prosthetics. And when he got out of the Navy, he decided that he would open up a laboratory here in the state of Washington in downtown Tacoma, Washington. And when he opened the laboratory, he had a dentist that came and worked for him. And they opened up to the public because he was making dentures in every nook and cranny, every garage, anything he could find an opportunity, friends and family. In the 50s, finally in 1961, he opened up office right directly to the public and it was flooded from that day. We've been busy for, for 60 years here in, in the Tacoma. Finally, in 1994, we ran that initiative, passed overwhelmingly, and we were able to open up our shingle actually with his name on the front instead of a doctor's name that they were partnering with for years and years. Oh. Wow, it's a great story. Yeah, so initially he had to have the dentist name on the business. That's correct. Until we were finally recognized, we won by over 15 percentage points in 1994. And, and all of us are just going gangbusters and loving our job every day. I bet. So, Melissa, you're third generation then. I am. And actually, Val has a daughter who's a denturist as well. Who's wow. Third generation. Yeah. 
<laughs> it must be an amazing industry if everyone's <laughs> kids are getting into it. Yes. So my my grandpa, as Val mentioned, was kind of one of the founders, or I guess you will, of the profession in the state of Washington, um, along with my dad and Val's dad. I was born in 1980, so I kind of grew up pretty much my whole childhood. They were kind of fighting to get this going, oh, um, yeah. to get it legalized. I wish my dad was here. He could explain it a little bit more. But in 1986, my dad and my grandpa actually opened up a clinic on the Nooksack Indian Reservation. And uh -huh. uh, because it was a federal land and under kind of a different laws. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. They were able to practice out there unsupervised as dentures. And, th and this is after, you know, they've gone through all the appropriate schooling because uh, at that time they had taken their education through Oregon and, and Idaho. So mm -hmm. there was education available because <laughs> Val's dad and my grandpa kind of helped create that. They worked out there for about eight years and then the initiative got passed and they moved into Bellingham. And I, you know, started out in the lab <laughs> cleaning flasks and um, started <laughs> doing, doing stuff, running cases, and that sort of thing in high school. Just like all of us. Yep. I took a break. I graduated from high school, went to college, got married, had some kids, and then came back. And about, oh, just over five years ago, I got my license. So I was in school for a few years before that. And here I am. So even after cleaning traps and all that, you still came into the profession. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I mean. I remember somebody when I was a kid I was touching like plaster and they're like, don't touch that. Once you touch that, <laughs> you're <in> that <laughs> <pit."> <laughs> that's what happened to me. <laughs> so do you work directly with your father now in the same facility? You know, we actually, we don't work in the same spot in the same days. <laughs> We're uh, that's probably good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we get along fine, but you know, usually he's off at a different office and, and so we, kind of keep things going that way. So do you guys have like a dental laboratory or a laboratory? Are you in with a dentist or are you in with a couple dentists or what, what does that look like? So all the dentures have a little bit different setup at our office and, and Val's office. We do have dentists that work for the denturists mm -hmm. and we have in-house labs. So we do make all of our own dentures at our lab, we do have some lab techs who do help us. Mm -hmm. And every denture kind of does their business a little different. You know, some of them do more of the lab work, some of them do less of the lab work, but most of them have a lab in their office. Gotcha. Yeah, you usually hear about denturists after seeing patients all day end up staying up until two in the morning making the dentures. Yeah. <laughs> do you guys do a lot of that or is it mostly you have technicians that do the work so it frees you up to see patients? I think both of us, we've used to do a lot of that. And so we sure. talking, right? and, and uh, we find people that we can train and give a nice skill set. As Melissa talked about, uh, lucky enough that I started, you know, I tell people I played football and polished dentures my whole youth. That was my, the two things I did. So <laughs> we learned around this profession. So we've done a lot of the lab work over the years. And finally, when it gets to the point that you realize your time can be sent clinically and successfully clinically, and have someone do those tasks that it takes a significant amount of time and still thereby help more people in the in chair side. Denture, that's a wonderful thing about denturists is that we have the ability if something isn't quite right that we want to have clinically, we go right down to the lab and we reset a couple of teeth and retry in the denture, make sure that they're going to be happy and functional. And then we can be successful from that point forward for our patients. Yeah, you don't send the setup back to the lab, wait three days for the reset, and then try it in again. That's pretty <laughs> nice. Exactly. A lot of states are not really regulated yet with denturism, but yet Washington is, and I know there's a handful of others. How do you see other states getting prepared for this? I don't know if I'm asking the right question. I think it's a good question, actually. Okay, um, thanks. <laughs> I think that uh, it's funny because both Melissa and I both work on the national level as well as the state level. Um, Melissa didn't brag to the point, but she should let you know that uh, she's the current Washington Denturist Association state president for, oh, for our Nice. Yeah. And so um, she's able to help out on a national level, as well as my daughter, Melissa. Megan Sharon is. We, I have a daughter, Melissa, by the way, so I, but we're lucky enough to have on a national level be prominent and encourage education. And the next step is going to be which initiative state is going to be put everything on the forefront and just give up everything like we did 25, 26 years ago 
and they're really going to have to dedicate themselves. And that's what we're looking for on a national level all the time is we're looking for the next state that really can kind of push this forward. It's very hard, as you can imagine, to have this done through the state legislatures, the ability for our opposition to be able to squash um, some kind of a bill that we put forward to regulate our profession in, in many, many states is, is difficult. So we're looking for that initiative state commonly. There's 25 to 30 good initiative states in the United States. Gather the signatures, put it on the ballot and have the citizens vote for it. Every time this initiative's got on the ballot in any state it's got on, it's passed overwhelmingly. Wow. So we're just looking for that next opportunity for a, a good bunch of professionals that want to go forward and, and have the wonderful lives that Melissa and I do. My dad, Chet, started off with and Melissa's grandfather, Ron, and have foresight. And that's what we're looking forward to is that foresight for that next state. So do you have any that you're working with right now that you see it up and coming? I know that we talked to, is it Katie May? Yeah, out of Elvis? Uh, Illinois. Yeah, that's working with them. So do you guys help each other out? I mean, do you kind of give them, you know, resources and or advice? Well, that's a neat thing about the National Association. And you just mentioned about how, you know, Melissa and I are, we all know each other, it seems. It's it's that way nationally as well. Katie actually came to the National Association and said, you know, here in Illinois, we just, we just don't have a good place to start with. And I'm motivated and I want to do this. And so the National Association actually helped Katie start up an association, actually promoted her association, funded it, and put together a, um, a website for her, helped her with their website. So the nice thing about uh, Katie is she's just so motivated. She's also in a state that's very difficult for us to promote. So we are doing all we can to do and to, to help Katie along. Our next state, Minnesota was very close a few years ago and somehow fell by the wayside. We've had uh, motivation in California. Um, very difficult to pass an initiative in California because it's so vast. Oh, yeah. We have motivation and had motivation in uh, Florida. And so we're looking for, like I said, in the, in the state of Washington, it was 12 individuals. It ended up being 20 individuals that put their money where their mouth was and gathered signatures and put it on the ballot. We're looking for that next opportunity. Excellent. Florida, huh? <laughs> They're coming, Barb. Florida is where I'm at. That's interesting. Sounds like a lot of this starts with grassroots, you know, getting people together that all believe in it and just getting out there and spreading word and getting signatures. That's exactly what it is. And it's fun. Actually, the very first event that we had gathering signatures in the state of Washington in 1994, it was the spring of 1994, and it was the opening day for the Seattle Mariners in the Kingdom back then, so before it got uh, exploded, imploded. And we were all sitting out there. There was, uh, at the time, about 30 of us, family members and indenturists, the promoters of the profession. And I, I had to come up with something. I had to come up with something that would, like, grab the eye of any of the reporters that were out there. So I invented a shirt, and the shirt said, yes, go initiative 607. That was our initiative, 607. Mm -hmm. But on the, on the front, I'm thinking, like, how can we grab everybody and – I said, Yo, oh, I know. On the back of it, back, we're still going to go to the back. It's going to say lower cost, better access for denture. Great. Okay, Val, you're wonderful. This is great. What's going to catch the eye of a reporter? I know. Don't be ruthless to the toothless. <laughs> I love that. And, so, and it was that grassroots effort that we gathered about 10,000 signatures that day with 30 of us just around opening day of the Seattle Mariners. And we had reporters gather with us and we had everybody out there. And as soon as it was opportunity was out in front of people, the reporters went crazy. We were in newspapers. We were called for radio broadcasts. I was on TV and radio doing this for months and months. It was truly one of the best times of my life. It was a lot of fun. And it was well respected. Everybody immediately grasped onto this concept that we could improve healthcare. We could do it for a lower cost and we could have greater access. It, it's, it's just a no-brainer. So what about the fear that most states have with pushback from the dental community? Did you see any of that when you guys started? Yeah, we had a lot of it. We had a lot yeah. of it. And Melissa can probably tell some stories about you know her dad and her dad was more on the front line with that kind of stuff. But the state of Washington, almost every one of those first 12 people that I mentioned had spent time in jail. They had opportunities where they had opened up a shingle and they wanted to promote the profession. It was not regulated in the state of Washington. And uh, they were at one point either fined or and there was half a dozen that spent time in actually jail because they were doing something 
illegal. And as we promoted, it's not illegal, it's just not regulated. And the pushback was real in the state of Washington. It's not, I, I don't want to scare the next state to be able to promote this. But once you get it through that bureaucratic mess that's there, the opportunity just far outweighs the, the restriction that we had at that point in time. Yeah. So, Melissa, you said that you're the president? Yeah, the Washington Insurance Association. So what's that like? I'm a NADL president right now, and I know how fun that yeah. is. So how long yeah. have you been doing that? I've been doing it for about, I'm on my second term right now. So about just over three years, I've been the president. It's been a learning experience. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm feeling big shoes. For sure. Uh, as we've been talking about today, they sacrificed a lot to get the profession to where it is today. And so I feel that weight, you know, we got to keep this profession strong and healthy. The Washington Insurance Association, we have a very strong association. We're very active. A lot of the things that we're working on right now have to do with insurance, getting insurance companies to recognize the insurance mm -hmm. providers and, and so that people can mm -hmm. use their insurance benefits when they come straight to a dentist, hmm. I've been working with kind of like the federal government on that through the VA and that and that sort of thing. Wow. And that's huge, right? I mean, it's kind of like running your head up against a brick wall multiple times a day. You don't yeah. get very far. So. <laughs> but dealing with insurance is always fun. Yeah. And the law. Yeah. But luckily we have a great uh, executive director. She doesn't give up and she she works really hard on that end of it. So that's what she does in her, her day job is, is deals with insurance and stuff. So she's better at that than I am. Wow. And right now we've been talking a lot about education hmm. and, and trying to get an, another school going in the state of Washington for, for dentists is what we're working on right now. So wow, it's been a lot of work. <laughs> is there a school now? You said another school. Is there a school? There is a right now currently. Unfortunately, we found out recently that due to the budget cuts and kind of a big enrollment mess that they're not going to be having it anymore. They're going to close the program. God. So it's unfortunate. Val was actually involved with getting that going. I don't really have any doubt we're going to be able to get another one in our state. So just got to keep plugging along and working at it. You talked about nepotism being a lot. So how do you guys attract new denturists? Is it mostly family? How does like somebody learn about it that wants to do that for a living? Is it word of mouth? You know, honestly, Barb, that's one of the, the hardest things I think about attracting denturists. And I think even to dental lab technicians too. Um, yeah. Nobody really knows what it is. Somebody learns about it in school. Yep. I know in at the school that they had here, there were some people who just kind of got into the program and didn't really, you know, really know much about it. But it does tend to be something you need to seek out. Currently, for me anyways, and, and also the... The National Denturist Association, I know, has been working hard on this. Is you know, what's our target market? I guess, if you will, for yeah, for students. Yeah, a lot of dental lab guys or gals, you know, they own their business, they're comfortable, they're happy where they're at, and they don't maybe don't want to go out and and be a denturist. We need to be able to look out and expand. Yeah, you know who who we're looking for as far as that goes. That's kind of a rambling answer to that question, but well, but yeah, true. it's very heavy nepotism because it's something that people don't really know about. And I've had a couple conversations where, you know, how do we get, you know, dental technology and dentureism out to the public so that we can get more interest in our field? And I, you're, you're, it's true. Nobody really does know about us either end. I think one of the wonderful things actually that this podcast does is I don't know if you guys realize how far reaching and spread that the, the, your influence is and to be able to have this opportunity to have our story put forward and the technician story put forward, how we're moving towards digital opportunities. So everything that you guys discuss is it's, it's wonderful to actually have this avenue. Thanks. It really is. The other part that and I think Melissa hinted is, is that yes, it is nepotism. And, but there are also in this economic downturn we're having, there are people who are going to be relocated out of professions that, aren't as readily available for them mm -hmm. and people you know, with great skill set, even if it's, you know, someone that had, Oh, my dad, my uncle was a dentist, but you know, I went into carpentry. It wouldn't believe how easy it is for us to promote and train and then get them in a wonderful schooling environment. We have foreign born dentists that are, they're schooled and they just can't get their dental license. Mm -hmm. um, in the state of Washington, I would say there's 25 or 30 
dentists that were foreign born and they just came to the United States and they said, you know what, gosh darn it, it's going to be too much work to go through the dental process, dental school process. So I want to be a hygienist or I want to be a dental technician or in our case, a denturist. Hmm. Finally, in the state of Washington, the neat thing is we can hire dentists like, uh, like Melissa stated earlier and Eric her dad and myself have uh, employed dentists and have wonderful relationships. Both of us have dentists that worked for us for decades. And that relationship of where you employ a dentist and you have that working relationship back and forth, the amount of access to care that we can provide to our patients is just phenomenal. In our situation, if you're a hygienist in the state of Washington, we don't have independent practice. But we have a couple of hygienists in Oregon and Washington that became denturists. So they could actually employ a dentist so that they could work in as a hygienist if they wanted and be a denturist. That is wow. So we have, we have a crossover of professions as well. Wow. And you said your daughter is an up and comer. Is she already working for you or, or is she, is she a denturist herself? She is. She is. She, again, another kid that grew up in the laboratory, uh, basically sweeping <laughs> and being flasked and being a plaster monkey. I don't know if we should say that. Can we say that, Elvis? Plaster monkey? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but we were all called that back in, you know, back in the day. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't want to offend monkeys. So. <laughs> she, was, she wonderfully came on to this. Uh, she's also a college graduate. She got into the program here in Tacoma, passed with flying colors, and became licensed, I think, what, three or four years ago, right, Melissa? Yeah. And she's doing quite well. She's doing quite well. Recently married, Good. and her husband got out of the military. He got a job with Microsoft, and and so they live up the road a little bit from us, uh, closer to Seattle. And uh, she loves her job. She worked four days a week, and and I work four days a week. We kind of go on and off, and we're lucky enough to help a lot of people. In fact, at our little clinic, one day a week, we specially put it together for people that are underinsured, and we have an opportunity wow. to help the underinsured population for a day. And just go 100 miles an hour, and it's been more rewarding. I go to sleep faster on my pillow on Monday evenings than I do any other day because we're able to help more people and have a lot more smiles. That's great. Aww. Roughly, does any of you know how many denturists there are in Washington State? About? Yeah, it's around 150, 160. Okay. Is that number growing a lot recently, or? Not growing a lot recently, no. But, I mean, it's steady, but it's not huge. Yeah. Not growing fast enough, actually, Elvis, because yeah. we're in a situation where most of these gentlemen that and ladies that started practicing in 1993 and 94, or maybe didn't even start practicing, but finally had their opportunity to have a license in 93 and 94, mm-hmm. 25 years later, they're saying, you know what? It's about time to post a shingle under someone else's name. And... We don't have the people to come in and the influx of dentures to be able to buy their practices. Mm. We're getting excited about the American Denturist College uh, down in Eugene, Oregon, but it's an online course. Yep, they've doubled the amount of people that they've had in their um, in their coursework over the last year or two. So we're hoping that they can even continue to expand. Like Melissa said, then the state of Washington hopefully get the opportunity that we open another brick and mortar school that we can have people come down here and get educated. And more importantly, having all those licensees have an opportunity to delve into that next state, whatever that next state. In the state of Washington, we had an opportunity where the National Association was in Oregon at the time. And when we put our initiative towards the ballot, the National Association came and a thousand percent was on board with us and had an opportunity to promote us financially and physically we're looking to do that to the next state. We're looking mm. and having more licensees and having more educational opportunities and having more people have the opportunity to go to Arizona and open up a, a denturist practice. California open up a denturist practice is certainly something we're looking forward to. And another thing, Valerie was speaking about educational opportunities. Another really great thing for our profession that's happened recently is the American Denturist College has actually started a bachelor degree program that you can get your bachelor's degree. Wow. It's technical science, but it's a bachelor's degree in denturism. And it's it's the first one in, available ever. So it's it's really exciting to see that happening in our profession, to be able to, to even get people with more education and more training brought into the profession. Sure. Are any of you going to go back and get your bachelorette? I'm currently doing that. Are yeah. you? That's exciting. Yeah, great. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I was 
I was actually in the first cohort of students that went through their diploma program. No. And now I'm in the first cohort of the people in the bachelor's degree program. So very cool. Congratulations. It's pretty neat. Yeah. So I've got a question about the never ending subject COVID. How are you guys affected by that? Were you closed down for a couple months or longer? We weren't really closed down. I know in some other states, they were completely closed down. And in our state, the directive was unless it was urgent or emergency, and that was defined as anything that could could cause harm within three months, if not performed, the procedure isn't performed, mm-hmm. which that, that was actually probably, to me, the most stressful thing about it, because everybody thinks they ha- are having an emergency if their denture is hurting their mouth. Oh, uh, yeah. But, you know, what about the guy who is, can't get his knee replaced, you know? So it was just a really, <laughs> that was hard. Yeah. Our office did close down for a couple of weeks just yeah. at the beginning because we, we didn't know what was going on. We were afraid that, you know, rem- I, it's just, it's so crazy how fast this has all happened. But in the beginning, when this all started, Nobody really knew what was going on or how contagious or deadly or anything it was. So we kind of shut down for a couple of weeks just to kind of get a feel for what was happening. And then we came back on a very limited basis. And now that order has been lifted and we're able to resume. It's still different. Yeah. Our patients wait in their car. And they call when they get there and we go get them and take their temperature and yeah. and all that. So it's different Yeah. We took all the magazines out of the waiting room it's and crazy. disinfecting the doorknobs every half an hour. It's it's like a lot more work for the receptionist. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. I actually hired a, an extra dental assistant three days a week just to come in and be the person that takes the temperatures, is an expediter throughout the clinic, disinfects all the doorknobs, does everything. Yeah. You know, anything that was distributed between the front office and back office is attended to. Like Melissa said, between the temperatures, we put in barriers into our pass-throughs between the front office uh, um, and the patients in the waiting room and the people in our, in our front to protect our staff. State of Washington, we actually have to have masks even through, even if you're six feet apart for our receptionists, even in the front, even if they have their barrier protected. So it's a it's a whole new world, right? Everybody says it's a new normal, and I and I and I see that that's the way it's going to be. Added costs for our profession is enormous. Uh, we Having the special suction, I do have a hygienist on staff. I have a dentist on staff. And so having special suction units and buried units and, and masks, and, and it's, it's, re, it's remarkable how this is going to change us. Yeah, for sure. Have you had any worries where you thought you were exposed or maybe somebody was around you? I haven't. I haven't either. You know, it seems like it's everywhere, but I haven't. One of my employees has been with me for 16 years. Her family was sick and they're quite a bit older and she wasn't feeling too good right before we were shut down. And we're shut down. My little office, we shut down for about five and a half weeks. I came in about a day or two a week and just took care of those emergent patients. People need a little adjustments. I figured the owner of the business, we have 14 employees. Wow. And so the owner of business, I would just tackle this myself and try not to bring it home. And so I would come in for that period of time. But in the very beginning, unbeknownst to us, um, she contracted COVID and was quite sick. We had to be quarantined in her home for 21 days at that time, three weeks. Mm. Um, That was the initial thought here in the state of Washington. And then now it's two weeks now. Mm. And she didn't pass it on to any of anybody else. We tracked all my employees and tracked everyone else, and we did quite fine. She's healthy as a horse now. She's uh, working three days a week for us, and she's doing tremendous. So we have had experience with it around the clinic. Lucky enough that we protect ourselves so well and, and our patients that it did not affect anybody. Yeah, I read something that said dentistry is, you know, very, very, because of all of the things that we do, the industry itself is um, very low risk for COVID. Yeah, I think so. I, you can imagine that one of the practice every single day disinfects every single surface and chairs that people sit in. And now we've even promoted that to our waiting rooms and handrails that we go up and down stairs and doorknobs will walk in and out of the clinic. So, so we went from 95% of, I think, protecting ourselves from this thing to 100% easily with these new protective orders that we're doing. Agreed. Yeah, we're not doing anything different. We're just doing it more. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What's next for Washington State? I mean, I know you guys are working on the school and you're promoting and you're trying to reach out to other states. As an association, 
Do you guys have a meeting every year? We do. We actually had to cancel it. Well, postpone it. Yeah. We normally have it in the spring. So mm. that was happening. Sure. We, at this point, tentatively postponed it until the National Interest Association meeting in October. So we're planning on having our, our, our meeting there. Oh, good. But we'll see. I, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Coronavirus, but. Where's that meeting at? The Orleans Casino in Las Vegas. Ooh. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. That's where ours is. Ours is in Vegas, too. And Vision 21 every year in January, we go to Vegas. Yeah, but it's kind of fun to <laughs> yep. say you've gone to Vegas. <laughs> yep. Yeah. October is just such a wonderful time for Washingtonians to get out of Washington because we just finally got through our summer. Oh, yeah. It's starting to get kind of terrible. And Las Vegas, the nice thing about it is you can head out to Lake Mead and the lake is still 85 degrees. It's still 95 degrees outside in mid-October. And we were leaving rain and destitute up here in the state of Washington at that point in time. So so Vegas is a wonderful route for us to to head on down south and take a week down there. We've had a lot of fun over the last many years. We've been at the Orleans Casino on a national level for, it's got to be six or seven years in a row now. We had the uh, international convention there. I think it was six years ago, seven years ago. And we're actually having the international convention as well as the national convention down there in 2021. We're putting it all together. So we'll have people from all around the world about the adventurous profession embark upon that great city and, and uh, cause some trouble. Oh, that's great. I didn't realize you guys had an international meeting. I bet you that's a lot of Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great. Having the Australians, the Australians have actually had an opportunity to have this profession for, for many years, and it's not as well known. It's in every province in Canada, having the Canadians come on down and visit with us and enjoy um, our hospitality in that environment. A lot of Western European countries, uh, not so many on the Eastern European side, but a lot of Western European countries uh, have, have um, dental technologists that basically perform the same functions we do. And they call themselves insurists if they're not dental technologists. So we're, yeah, it's it's a wonderful community. We have so much fun doing it. Cool. When you guys have those meetings, do you have CE or is it basically just kind of meet? I mean, what kind of CE do you do at those meetings? Yeah, no, our, our CEs are just completely comprehensive. A lot of dental implant uh, technology in the last uh, half a dozen years to a dozen years, of course. A lot of asepsis, making sure that we're mm-hmm. staying up on asepsis. Kind of interesting. We always have a very wonderful course on that. Hmm. A lot of dental anatomy, a lot of dental pathology, just to renew yourself, making sure that you have an opportunity. When you're in or orally and you're reviewing uh, a patient's oral cavity, when your number one job for how many years, all of us were just dental technicians, uh, as we talked about, you know, setups and plastering and all the stuff that we do. And now to make sure that we're clinicians and staying on top of the clinical side of it, we have every single one of those opportunities to re- remind us what we're looking for on a clinical side. A lot of digital denture work that's happening right now. It's just, we probably put on, I know, Melissa, you might remember, but we probably put on in a four-day coursework, I think we probably put on about 24 or 25 hours worth of CEs on the, in those four days. Wow. In Vegas last year? Yes. I think you're about right. There was a lot. That's yeah. Well, yeah. And the year before there was a lot too it's amazing how different it is from year to year what they have available well i was going to ask you about that in the whole digital dentures because i mean it's the hottest topic for the last couple years here in the dental laboratory industry is it big in denturism you guys excited about it do you see the benefits of it it's interesting because uh, not really uh forever and ever the quality of the teeth that The cosmetic appearance, the individual setting tooth by tooth that a denturist does to make sure that that patient, they give you a picture and just say, this lateral, well, they they don't say a lateral, but this lateral was slightly turned and this is just how my mom's was and this is how my tooth was. I really want to have that. A little bit harder to perform for years as much on digital denture side. There's some good technology coming out now where teeth are set individually. They're actually come on the card. They come on cards. They are actually designed and actually set tooth by tooth instead of having that monolithic look to them. But we're having, we, mm-hmm. I think it's coming a long way. Uh, uh, I've just recently invested in, in a system. I'm going to experience it here in the next month or so. And we're going to find out if it you know lives up to what we've done here in our clinic for the last 60 years. Wow. There's a lot more dentures, I think, up in Canada embracing digital dentures. That seems to be my impression of it anyways. They seem to be really interested in that, the dentures up in Canada. 
the point I think that it makes it interesting for them is they have a continual influx. They have new people. That If you look at the age range of denturists in Canada, when we see them at international conventions, there's a lot of late 20s, early 30s, 40-year-olds. Yeah. You go to Washington convention right now, and I might be the young guy at 55 years old. It's uh, yeah. Melissa's the young guy. <laughs> and then my daughter's a real young guy. But but for the most part, it's hard for someone like me to kind of go, you know, this is a good idea. When we've done it so well for this, you know, 25 years, we've been licensed in the state of Washington. We've done it and made it perfect and, and made our name. But I think that as the technology gets better and better, um, it's going to be it's going to be something that we're going to just have to adapt to as we've had to do many things in, in our profession over the last 50, 60 years. Yeah, I haven't seen a lot of it. Like I'm from a bigger lab and we're really not doing a whole lot of it. I know there's a fair amount of interest in it, but I think it's taken longer um, than you would have thought to really see it take off. So I think it's still early in the game. They still have a lot of things to do better. Definitely what you guys are doing is the best out there. So it's going to take a lot to uh, get it that good. Well, and the quality of the acrylics that they were using for a long time in these initial ones, as we talked about the monolithic kind of look yeah. to printed teeth, not getting that good anatomy and the design and, and those things, and just in the teeth themselves, even if you have the best design in the world and really made it unique to the patient, to have that, it's just never look like the natural tooth setup that we would do consistently in our clinics. So hopefully this next stage, this next level where there are individual teeth that are placed into a high class, high grade acrylic that's going to be even as strong or stronger than the packing process that we do right now. If we can make that next jump, I think it's going to be just unstoppable. Yep. Barb, we don't, we don't, at our offices, we don't do anything digital yet. Yeah. So we're, we're in the same boat as you, <laughs> maybe even, maybe even a little bit further behind, but yeah. we're just not there yet. I think for some people it's, how is this going to pay off for me? You know, we're going to spend this amount of money and how many, you know, how many dentures do I have to make oh, you know, sure. when I have all this stuff now? And I think that's kind of one of the, uh, the problems with getting that technology out there is, is that. Yep. I agree. Well, I know a lot of people are using the digital denture as an economy way of making denture. And I don't even know, does Deturist even do economy dentures? It's not really your style, right? We do them. Um, we do. Do you? Okay. Yeah. You know, we, we get a lot of people who come into our offices, like Val was saying, he has a day where they do serve for underinsured people, uh -huh. dealing directly with the public. We get a lot of people who are in pretty rough shape financially. Mm hmm and you need an economy denture. At our office, we don't do really super, you know, cheap, but like the teeth we use are, are going to be a little bit less quality. So they're going to be, be an economy denture. Yeah. Less expensive. Sure. It is. Yeah. And it's, but it's also nice to be able to offer that, right? Because, you know, like I said, a lot of the people who come in really are in bad shape financially and they need teeth. They feel bad about themselves because they don't have teeth. They're wanting to get a job or go to their daughter's wedding or whatever it may be, but they don't have a lot of money. So being able to offer that, for me, that's one of the most important things is being able to serve more people mm -hmm. as a denturist. To me, that's one of the biggest benefits of our profession is that we're more readily able to serve those people than your typical traditional dentist office. Yeah. I'm really proud of that with our profession. Melissa, that's a great point. And even more importantly is that we've talked about a couple of times, the access to care. And so if someone has to go to a dentist and get a full mouth examination, x-rays, 195 to $250 later, and then they can get their upper denture repaired. They can get just a free consultation at most of our denture clinics in the state of Washington. Almost all of us offer free denture exams. So you come in they're having an opportunity to do an oral exam where they have sat back with their dentures in almost any other state in the union. And for like 10, 15, 20 years before they see a, a dental provider, mm. that access to care where we're able to kind of look in there and, and look for those lesions and make sure that the patient's bite is proper. They're having some TMJ issues. They don't even know that they have those things, but because they get an opportunity to have 160 licensees in the state of Washington that are not in any other state, they walk through the front door, they see a dental professional, and they're better off for it. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. And access to care is important, and we know how hard the removable aspect of all of this is with access to care. So, I mean, I deal with dentists all day long that don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. What about your relationship with labs in the area? 
our audience base is mostly laboratory technicians. Do you guys get any feedback from labs? Do they like you guys? Do you send work to other labs? Do they prefer you not to be there because you don't send work? They love us, actually, Elvis. In, in, in our little area, we work so well. Number one, we do a lot of framework that most of us, in fact, almost all of us don't have framework laboratories. And so we're working with many different laboratories that we have this opportunity. Also, um, with some of the bigger laboratories in the area, we do a lot of implant-supported work. And that implant supported work in conjunction with the dentist, and we're doing the setups and we're providing the prosthesis in conjunction with dentists here. We need the laboratory help to process uh, and maybe process our bars or do some things like that. So we open up the whole world to local laboratories. Additionally, when someone comes to my clinic, we're lucky enough to perform a crown as a supporting tooth structure, make the partial denture and all that. But denturus, people walk right into the denturus office and say, I want a new partial. Well, we can't just make you a new partial denture. We have to get that natural dentition attended to. So they go to the local dentist. We're now sending the the crown and bridge work out to a a local laboratory. We're making the frameworks again in a local laboratory. And we're really involving that whole dental community all together at one time and, and increasing the ability to help these patients. Awesome. Another thing for some removable labs, having a denturist even on staff you know, would be a very helpful thing for them too. As you know, sometimes you are dealing with a situation that's a little tough and the dental office is having a hard time figuring out and the ability to send a denturist out into the field, I think would be a great opportunity. And I've, I've talked to several dental labs in the area who, who kind of wanted to do something like that. There's an opportunity there as well to benefit the lab owner. <laughs> in that sort of an arrangement too. I would definitely look at that if it ever became accepted. Is that the term? Not legal, but... Regulated. (laughs) Regulated. In Indiana, I would totally look in on that because we are constantly having to chair-side assist on removable cases. Yeah. But Val, you mentioned overdentures. Do you guys see a lot of those? Yeah. How does that system work? It's our primary focus in my little clinic here. In fact, my full name of the denture office is Northwest Dental Services and Implant Center. Nice. We have a doctor that lucky enough that we sent out and got trained by the Nobel BioCare Company. I've been to mm-hmm. Yerba Linda a couple times and trained on site. I work with two local oral surgeons that have me come into their clinic and help along to temporize dentures into removable fixed prosthetics. Then they come down to my clinic and we're we're manufacturing titanium substructures and acrylic dentures and hybrid dentures. We do a ton of uh, locator work in our clinic. We're lucky enough in, in the state of Washington to work with very good dentists that we can, alongside we uh, going forward and helping patients actually be able to wear dentures that they've never wore dentures before because they couldn't keep that dang lower denture in. Oh, yeah. So we do a lot of overdenture work here in the state of Washington. Nice. So the surgeon places the implants and you're there chair side to do the conversion. Yes. And then once that patient is healed and is ready for their final, it comes back to you for that whole process. That's exactly right. And there's only probably, I don't know, Melissa, what would you think about? 10 to 12 of us that actually have dentists in our clinics and the other, you know, 100 professionals out there are working basically in their own environments. But most of those are in a clinic that's just adjacent to or just down the road from their friend who's a dentist and we're working mm-hmm. in conjunction with the dentist and the denturist all the time. I think even more importantly, and it's as important for us, our, our relationship with the dental laboratories is we have an opportunity, as Melissa and I do, we're overwhelmed with as many people that want to come through the front door. So hiring a good quality dental technician to come in and help us uh, promote our services has been a wonderful opportunity. But the relationship we have with the local dentist and involving that whole community, the associations will never get along from the dental association. (laughs) But us on an individual level where we get a chance to see that dentist and we go out for a cup of coffee and that kind of stuff, it's a truly a wonderful environment. Yeah. It has to be. It's the only way for the patient to benefit. Agreed. Melissa, is your place doing overdentures? We do a lot of locator Mm -hmm. at at our offices. Both of our dentists place implants, and we also have relationships with oral surgeons in the area if there's something that, you know, they need to see an oral surgeon for as far as the implants go. Sure. I personally, I don't have as much experience with the 
more like the, the hybrids and that sort of thing. Val does, my dad does. Personally, I do more locator type stuff. And if, if there's something yeah. where a bar is needed or whatever, I, right now I'm, <laughs> I'm a little uncomfortable with that. So I hand that over to my dad or, or refer out. I, it's amazing really what two lower implants can do for somebody who has a lower denture. And that is just so, it's amazing to see how much different their life can be with just that simple of a procedure, really relatively simple. Yeah, I bet. We do a lot of them here in our lab, but we don't get to see as often that clinical experience Yeah, of that patient snapping it in oh, yeah. and going, oh my God, I can't <laughs> eyes, move it. Their eyes light up. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine you guys get to see that every day. Yeah. I'm a big fan of denturism. I think a dental technician with the right aspiration can really help their career and their lifestyle by becoming a denturist. And I think what you guys are doing is great. Yeah, me too. It is. Well, we appreciate this opportunity. And like we stated, six states in the United States. So Oregon, Idaho, Montana, uh, Maine, Arizona, and parts of Colorado. It's more of a dental auxiliary in Colorado. Having an opportunity that we can promote this profession and as a denturist and and have people see us by what we do every single day and help people and have an opportunity that maybe someone listening to this podcast is sitting in a little tiny state in, in the nook and cranny of the world and saying, you know what, I, I did make that denture for my grandma. It was so satisfying. I was helped by this time, but how can I do this every day? It's have an opportunity for American Denturist College and for you to spread our word out here and hopefully someone can knock on our door and we can help them explode the next state for our profession well said absolutely yep. let's work on indiana yeah <laughs> <We're good. laughs> we'll be right there you put out a shingle and, and i'll sit up in front in a, in a lawn chair and we'll promote it all right there you go that's good to me the next sporting event if that ever happens again <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll set up well val melissa we appreciate you coming on Thanks for us. It was fascinating. I love what you guys are doing. And all I have to say is, you know, remain ruthless to the toothless. <laughs> yep. We appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Huge thanks to Val and Melissa. I really actually think I was home on a day off during COVID when we talked to them, which was super great. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Hold on. I just, hold on. Hold on. I just lost it. I've got these pop-ups that keep coming on. Hold on. Are they porn pop-ups? I wish. That'd be no fun. (laughs) But I can't read what you've got on here and I keep clicking on. Just give me two seconds. All right. We, on the podcast, Elvis and I, think it's a great profession and service that benefits the patient. We encourage any technician wanting to take their skill and their career to the next level to look into the field of denturists. And if your state doesn't recognize licensed insurance, well, maybe it's time to get on board and help them do something about it. Now, we talked about the October National Denturist Conference in Las Vegas during this conversation. Barbara and I were planning on going, but just like every other show this year, they have decided to cancel the in-person meeting. Bummer. But they are hard at work at looking into a virtual alternative so denturists around the globe can still get connected and get the education they need. So head over to nationaldenturist.com to keep up to date on their national meeting. And make sure you head over to americandenturistschool.com to learn more about becoming a denturist and their new bachelor's degree program that Melissa mentioned. And speaking of schools, Melissa did mention that their local college is ending their denturist program. But Melissa just let us know yesterday that the school has decided to keep the program and will be offering it next school year. Awesome. So if you are a removable technician in Washington State and have a passion for the patient, which we all do, why not check out this amazing profession? Look for the links on this episode's show notes. Awesome, everybody. That's all we got. Have a good week. We appreciate it. See ya. Bye. Bye. I know, it's been a rough day. (sighs) Sorry.